remember now the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. You don't have an effective prayer life without it. Because you pray according to the will of God, and that comes from the word. Remember that uh, the key to prayer and the key to living the dynamics of the Christian life and the study of the word of God is the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. Personal sin hinders that. It, it results in carnality. How to get out of carnality, evidence of it, of course, is personal sin. How to get out is confess sin, uh, according to what the Bible calls sin. And that work takes us to the cross, and as a believer, where we confess our sins in the blood of Christ, works continuously, cleansing us, not for our salvation this time, but rather for sanctification. And that's an important principle of the new covenant church age. So let's be sure we do all that, and we'll have a short prayer and end to our morning study. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way today by the automobile that is the local church, and the internet, which is the universal church. We're thankful to be a part of both of those today, Father. What's going on in our United States of America? What's going on? It's this lag time in the church to the Word of God is just appalling. We've got to be on the front line both of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God, Father, and we pray that you would encourage our hearts to be faithful in that walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are in First Thessalonians. If you open your Bible to the last three, we're in chapter 1, in the last three verses of chapter 1. You know, it's a really interesting book, and the reason I chose to go through this book with you is that it's basic. It's a really basic good book. And the, there's two theological themes in this book. And they're both really dynamic. Um, one is soteriology, that is reviewing what salvation is all about, and the church's responsibility to take it forth, to sound it forth. And the other is eschatology, which is uh, the study of the last days. I've told you this before, but every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with a reminder, with a statement about eschatology. And that's, that's kind of interesting to me. Well, here we are. We're in verses 8, 9, and 10 now. Have you, have you got your Bibles open? Well, get them open. If you didn't bring one, there's one already provided. Study it. First Thessalonians, look in your index and find a page number. Here's what verse 8 says. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. That's the Thessalonians. Not only in Macedonia and Archaea. That's the region. We would call that Greece today. But watch this. But also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth. Isn't that amazing? So that we have, as the Pauline team, we have no need to say anything. We can't add a thing to what's going on in your ministry. It is lights out. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, Paul looks at their ministry. He's getting reports. It's a young church. This is a young church when Paul is, is talking here. This is a very young church. You remember, Paul only got to say, th stay three Sabbaths, Acts 17. He only got to spend three Sabbaths with him before uh, he was run out of town for preaching the gospel. You know, you can't come here and turn our world upside right. Up, upright, I don't know. He was turning upside down and... Right side up, thank you. I need a teacher every once in a while to teach me. 
the word of the Lord. Look, I want you to pay attention to two words. Watch this now. See the word. Look in, look in verse 8. Sounded forth. You with me? Now listen to me. What has sounded forth from them? The word of the Lord. Isn't that good? The word of the Lord. Now watch the other one that's important to us today. See the word gone forth? See that word gone forth? What's gone forth? Yes, their faith towards God. Do those not combined? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. The word of the Lord. Say, that's it. That's, they're on top of their game. Verse 9. And, and he says, look, I, I don't know what else to tell you. You're going lights out. Look, I got... The reports I'm getting back on you, I mean, you're doing, I mean, lights out. You know what I mean, lights out, I guess. Verse 9, for they themselves, this is the people where they're having ministry to, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you. And watch this, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God. See, that's the point that you move outward from, sounding forth and gone forth from your salvation experience through your spiritual growth to take it to other people, right? The gospel that changed your life dramatically is the message you carry to other people. And I'll tell you, it's, it is so easy today Talking the gospel today is so easy. Listen, I say, I say, I say to people, has a COVID affected your family any in a sickness or death? Or, or your friendships or your friends or your neighborhood? I very seldom find one person that it hasn't that it hasn't affected that larger area. And I say, has there been any deaths? And they say, yes. I mean, I, I don't mean anybody that doesn't have a connection with it. Right? And I say, well, how are you dealing with it? And he said, well, are you prepared? to get to COVID, and what would be your greatest, and yeah, yeah, and I go through, I try to do everything that I can do to, I want, that's good, that's good. Suppose you got it, what would be your greatest fear? Well, the greatest fear, I would die, why would that be? Well, I've got two kids. I talked to a lady the other day, I have two kids. Wouldn't it be good for them to know as well as you that if you died, you could go to heaven? Oh, yes. Could you tell me how I could do that? I would like to go to heaven. Could you tell me? Well, then we go through, <laughs> we go through a whole bunch of stuff. And I'd say, well, that's pretty good. Can I just show you what, what, can I tell you from my perspective what I think? And I, and I give her a clear, a very clear gospel that he died for my sins. He was buried and raised on the third, third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I write it on the napkin. I do this in my morning hours. And I say, buried three days on the third day. He said, he would rise from the dead. I write that down. Romans 1.16. And we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, a gift of God. And I write that down, Ephesians 2.8.9, on a napkin to give her back. That's what gets you to heaven. Do you believe that? I, I, I said, I didn't say, do you understand that? <laughs> do you believe that for your personal salvation?
Well, I'm not quite certain. They start getting nervous. And I say, well, look, I'm going to be here for an hour. And I'm here three days a week. I'm more than willing to talk about this, but this is what you have to know and do. And I'll tell you, the reception is phenomenal. I've had nobody push back on me. And my job is to, is to tell them the truth. My job is to share the gospel with people and tell them how to be saved. This COVID has opened a wide door for us to be very evangelical. People are, are fearful of dying. And rightly so. We've had 7,500 deaths since March in Alabama to COVID, if our numbers are right. They could be right because we don't live in New York, so the numbers could be right. This is a great day in your life to share with people because they're all worried about COVID, and they'll talk about COVID, and they'll talk about family members that have had it and, and people who have died. They'll talk about it. They need to have the assurance that if it knocks on their door in their life, that they're prepared. I'm just saying this is, I'm telling you, the fields are white ready for harvest. If, if, if he can find some people that will actually share the gospel, not just the COVID, but the, but the solution to it. No matter what it does to your life, the Lord is the key. Well, this little church at Thessalonica was doing it, boy. They were doing it. They were taking the word of the Lord, which we know is the gospel, because we read that in verse 5. Look at verse 5. We know what they're talking about. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and the Holy Spirit in full conviction, and we did that study on it. And we're going to pick up further on that. This is a great day. People, just open the door on the subject of COVID. Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> Everybody's talking about it, but nobody's got an answer. Give them the solution. Last Sunday, we studied how Paul connected three important progressive actions of developing a model ministry. We're going to talk about that today, a model ministry a ministry that has a model of God's will in your life, and we'll talk about that. This is where I got that idea from, was Thessalonians many years ago. And listen, here's how the model actually works to get to it. You've got to be saved by a grace gospel. You've got to become an imitator of the Lord through milk doctrines. And through that, you get into meat, and meat takes you into model ministries. And let me tell you, this is where it really happens. This is what Paul is bragging on them. Look at this. Look in verse um, imitators in verse 6. In verse 7, the word example. Look at verse 7. See the word example? That's topos, T-U-P-O-S. It shouldn't have been translated in English. If you was going to translate this word into English, you would put in sample, E-N, not E-X. But this means type. See the word type? T-U-P-O-S means type or model. That's, that's, and and they, they had become that. They had gotten saved, become imitators of the Lord through male doctrines, and had now become model ministries through meat. Through, through the growth of meat doctrines. And we've talked about that. This is, we talked about it last Sunday to you. We, did, we didn't talk about the model, but we set it up so we could talk about it today. You may recall that Paul connected these three doctrinal principles, being saved, being imitators, and being models, by the word genomai. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Genomai. It means to, to become it means a changed, 
conditioned by something. The gospel changed you. Uh, milk doctrines change you. Meat doctrines change you. Yeah, well, anyhow. We talked about that. And it's important you understand, get on mine. It, it, it began with a spiritual change from a sinner unbeliever to a saved believer by the grace gospel of Jesus Christ in verse 5, which I just read. Last week, we studied the spiritual, the spiritual change condition of a newborn baby needing milk doctrines for the assurance of his salvation to become an imitator of the Lord, walking it out in his life. Walking by faith, walking in the Spirit. That those early that that those parts, those those meat doctrines that are basic to the Christian way of life, basic. We read about that in First Peter two 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 and Hebrews Hebrews eleven Hebrews five eleven through fourteen is a key verse, and and then this should be First Thessalonians one six not sixteen one six. However, last time I ran out of time uh, about the spiritual uh, change condition of meat doctrines to become modeled ministries to others, like in verse 7 that he now explains in verse 8 and 9. So I'm going to talk about four things this morning about model of a ministry. This is really important for you because I've, I've got a church that is really moving into modeled ministries. And, and it's a, you need to be aware of it. And I've talked with many of you that have this already occurring in your life, and a lot of you are on the edge of it. Point number one. After becoming imitators, that is, milk doctrines, that has now got them the assurance of their salvation and has now placed a hunger and a desire for meat doctrines. They have become imitators by cycling milk doctrines for assurance of their security. Remember, security is in God. Assurance is in you based on the word of God in you. The Thessalonian believers have now become seekers of meat doctrines to grow spiritually in their daily experience of relationship with a living true God. These people have turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. To serve, circle that word, because once you become an imitator, God is now pushing you towards serving him as a living, true God, a frontline God who is going to take you into uh, fields ready, white, ready for harvest. You need to really know this. Under spiritual growth maturity, out of Hebrews 5.14, the writer says solid food or meat, King James, is for meat doctrines are for the mature, the teleos, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You see, what meat doctrines is going to do, listen to me, is going to push you out into the world. I, God is going to say, I want you to share this with the world. Christ came to die for the world, didn't he? He's not going to be content with you just to sit in the church and be quiet. He's going to move you in a church like ours to become an imitator to begin to walk in this doctrine out in your daily life, success in your marriage, success in your family, success in the sense of what God is willing to do with you in your, in your life in personal ways, imitators, where, where you stop imitating what you've been told all your life and stop imitating what you think you ought to do and start paying attention to what the Bible says, who you are and what you ought to be doing. so that you stop imitating what the world has told you or your parents have told you and you start imitating what your heavenly father tells you. 
That little pamphlet of 50 things, you ought to pay attention to those 20 status privileges. That's who you are. I meet so many insecure believers, it's unbelievable. Now, I know why they're insecure. And listen, that's just an issue. Because they haven't grown under milk doctrines. They haven't become an imitator of the Lord. And the first thing you have to do is take in milk doctrine so you can move from being an imitator to seeking the need in your life for meat doctrines of the Christian way of life so that God can get, begin to push you out into the world with the truth of the message of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you're in the world, but the world shouldn't be in you. You should be in the world, and you should be active in the world. But the world shouldn't be in you and shouldn't be active in you. Agreed? Yeah. Be in the world, but not of the world. Listen to Ephesians 4.13, talking about the mature believer. Until, see, there's a process. A baby believer goes from milk to an imitator. An imitator is now has a great desire for meat doctrines of the Christian way of life. Until we all attain, this is where Bob, some of you that remember Bob Thiem's ministry, he would say it's important to reach and maintain spiritual maturity. Right? And he referred to the key, the key part of spiritual maturity being super grace. And that word attained is where that whole doctrinal principle came from. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now watch the word to. Circle every time you see the word to and pay attention to it. Because what God wants us is to attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, become a meat eater, to a mature man, see that's the first two, to a mature man, to a mature person in Christ, to a mature person in Christ. I'm no, longer a I'm no longer a baby. I'm no longer immature in my behavior or thinking. I'm now mature in my behavior and thinking in the Lord. Here's the second two. This is the mature man. And this is where the mature man ought to go, ought to go to super grace, where nothing is going to distract you from your walk with the Lord. To the measure, here's super grace. Here's describing the epitome or the, the, the top classification of a mature believer. Here's the top, and we, we gave a title to it, super grace. To the measure to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Not partial, full. You're not even thinking about an imitator anymore. You're talking about the fullness of Christ being reflected. Not an imitator, right? Right? And listen, when you do that, when you take your spiritual maturity to the measure of the stature, your ministry, your life, and ministry that comes from it in, to other people, outside yourself, right? I'm not looking for consent. I'm just making sure you know. has impact. It has impact. It has impact on other people's lives generationally. The impact from super grace goes, goes historical. It can go, it can go I inside a family. It can go in a nation. The impact that comes from this, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in impact is unbelievable. 
How do I know it? Look, I, we still have Paul. We still have Peter. We still have Timothy, John, James. Recorded forever in the forever word of God. That's the principle of what God wants to do with our life. Now, you may not see the visible impact, like we have a Bible of these guys' names, but when you get through with the judgment seat of Christ in heaven, you will have seen yours. It will be connected with your name written in the book. Come on now. And not just theirs. Because that's what that's all about. And you don't want to miss that. And I don't want you to miss it. Last week, we listed in our study guide that was handed out 15 milk doctrines that I call starters in the Christian life. I didn't list them again because you have them on your paper and you should pay attention to them. And you should have them under your belt. Because under your belt means the world needs to hear it. Under your belt, when I say you need to have them under your belt, I mean you need to have them because the world needs to hear them. The church needs to hear it. Other churches need to hear it. Other believers need to hear it. Believe me, I talk all week long to people about it. Not just you on Sunday or Wednesday. Because people really want to know. They really want to know. Now, they may fuss when you tell them, and that's okay, too. I'm used to that. Listen, it all comes out in the wash, as my grandmother used to say. Fifteen milk doctrines. I thought this would be important, but they are starters. They're not the end. They're the, in my opinion now, I wrote down 15 I thought were starters. Point number two. Paul brags on Thessalonians. He don't brag a lot because he's, he's too deep in the trenches of fighting for them. But it, in this book, he brags on them. He brags on their spiritual growth advancement to reaching maturity and becoming a model to other believers in through their ministry. A modeled ministry where other people are impacted, I mean impacted by it. Impact in such a way that their life will never be the same. And it could go generationally because of it. Verse 7. So that in our, for 1 7 in our text. So that you became an example, the topos, to all the believers. To all the believers. In the Greek language, that D is dative. It is date of advantage. To whose advantage was it to have these spiritual mature people take their ministry out to the world? And listen, we'll talk about the model in a moment. Taking their ministry out to the world. You, see, you, you miss some things when you read it. So it's my job to make sure you don't. The date of, see I wrote date of, it's date of advantage. But to whose advantage? Your advantage? No, to their advantage, to other people's advantage. Your model ministry is to the advantage of everybody else out there that hears it. And listen, once you have your model down, and I'm going to explain what that means, you take that, you establish that well, in some geographical area, it'll be there as long as God desires it to be there. It won't be there for a, a, a moment. It won't be there for a month. 
it'll be, listen, it'll probably be there through your lifetime for sure. That's called impact. Are you there? I think you are, maybe. Look at, take your modeled ministry to all the believers, all the believers. It's to their advantage you do that, and then he, he lists where they've gone. They, listen, this church in a short time, I mean a short time, has covered all of Greece. That's getting it, ain't it? You know what Paul did? Here's what Paul did. Paul had a model. He knew what his model ministry was. You go in there, you preach the gospel, get people saved. You take them into milk doctrines, get their security in God, not in themselves, about their salvation. You teach them how to, how to imitate the Lord under milk doctrines. You watch the Holy Spirit developing, you raise up teachers that you didn't even know was going to be there. And every chance you get, send back guys like Timothy or Titus, whoever you got, to reinforce them. Today we do it through the internet, don't we? Rick does that. Right, Rick? You reinforce your, you reinforce your guys on the ground. How do you do it? I guess internet or telephone or something. That's how you do that today. I mean, you don't, you don't have to put boots on the field, but if you didn't have that, you'd have to put boots on your field to do it. In Paul's day, he had to put boots on the field. I mean, we live in a miraculous age today. I mean, that's some unbelievable what you can do with the Internet today. It just staggers me. But you still have a responsibility with that. Uh, unless you can say with Paul, I have no need to say anything more to you. Just go get it. I'm turning loose and going to another place. That's a model ministry. When you have it, the model works if it's built on the principle of divine will. If it's built on the word of God and the will of God in your life, that model will work anywhere you take it. And if you do it right in the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, and make sure you teach the word of God to them. Thus saith the Lord, your growth in Christ will put a stamp on it to the stature, to, you know, to, this, to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Boom, that's the stamp. And how long that goes, it'll go, listen, it'll probably go beyond your lifetime. Yeah, boy. Now, let me show you a couple things. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth. That's a perfect passive indicative, third person singular. From, that's ek plus the ablative of separation from you. You've gotten out, you've gotten out and shared with the world. And he, and he says, not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but every place your faith towards God has gone. Notice the word sounded forth and gone forth are both perfect tenses. Look on your paper, P-E-R-F, that's perfect, abbreviation for perfect. Now listen, I wrote this because I, I've become aware that many people don't know when I say that's a perfect tense, so let me explain it to you in a Greek language. There are two, sounded forth and gone forth. The perfect tense means completed action in the past with completed results in the present. What they've done is they have a model. God has given them a model, a ministry. Much of it come from Paul, his model. They, they improvised. They took it and, you know, fit it to their style of doing it. And took it, sounded forth and gone forth, both in the perfect tense. That's impact. 
That's impact. And listen, their model, their model of their ministry was working everywhere they dropped it. You understand that? It didn't matter if they went to some place in their own community or if they took it outside their community or outside their, quote, state. The model worked everywhere they took it. And most of that model came from Paul's. And then they, you know, they worked the model to fit their ministry and their, you know, their personality and all the stuff that goes with it. These Thessalonian believers were now engaged in what's called, I call model, I don't call it, the Bible calls it modeled ministry. They went forth from salvation personally by, great, by the grace gospel to imitators of the Lord through milk doctrines to a model of maturity and out of that to the stature of the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where Bible doctrine should take you in some form or another. Point number three. Let me ask you, does your ministry to others have a model? A model. I mean, can you define it? If it, if it does, you are on the right path. Keep working on your model. Your model could work anywhere. Once, it's, once, it's, once God gets through telling you exactly what he wants done, that model will work anywhere in the world. And it will impact, depending on how it's, how it's delivered and all of that. You know, you got to... You know, you got to be spiritual to create it, and then you got to be spiritual to execute it. If it doesn't, if your model, if your ministry doesn't have a model, re-examine the scriptural purpose of your ministry. Spell it out to get a clear model. You are not ready to do that. You're in ministry, but you're not ready to model it yet. And it may, listen, it may never occur. But it should. If you, if you maintain your spiritual momentum, moving from imitator of the Lord into becoming the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Everywhere Paul went, he encouraged the model, and the model, when it was taken, always worked and always impacted. Well, it would be well worth your look at that. In verse 8, Paul said, The word of the Lord sounding forth, and your faith towards God going forth. See, that's what it's all about. That's, that's what the model does. It is important not to neglect your spiritual growth once your model is designed and your ministry kicks off. Do not neglect your spiritual growth through the daily study and inhale-exhale of meat doctrines and develop a strong prayer life and a strong relationship live, life with a living true God. I mean, daily. And you will see God do miraculous things through your life. I mean, thing, now, ministry is wonderful. And I want everybody to have ministry. But some of those people are going to have modeled ministries. God is going to set you down and show you what he wants done. I mean, it's going to be clear. It's not going to be confusing. It's going to be clear. 
And once you get that model and you begin to use that, you're going to see God, if you, if you execute it properly with him, you're going to see him impact. You're going to see people's lives impact. You're going to see their lives impact like Gittlemai, where there's going to be spiritually changed conditions in their life. We have always had these ministries. I was, I was an enormously fortunate pastor. I took a spiritual mature church. Most pastors don't get spiritual mature churches. God gave me a spiritual mature church 47 years ago. And, and we've, we've seen these model ministries go out of here like crazy. You can take it anywhere. But once that thing is developed in your life and it begins to be executed, don't get, don't, it's not a toy to play with. You still have to maintain your stability in the Lord. Do not neglect. Being a meat eater, do not neglect having a, a strong, prayerful life. You know, there's one characteristic of Jesus that just stunned me as a young believer, his prayer life. You would think as the son of God. He'd have a little slack in that deal, wouldn't you think? Well, I know what you were about to say, Father. <laughs> well, I know what you... Uh, yet, listen, he had a strong... Why? Because in the humanity, in his humanity, he had to maintain a very strong daily relationship with the Heavenly Father for the work that needed to be done through his humanity. Jeez. Do we not understand that? I mean, where is this ministry coming from us? Through our humanity. And that humanity ought to be the fullness of Christ. So don't neglect that. This type of failure and neglect will greatly affect the model and the ministry. Point number four in closing. Finally, it is also important to pay attention to how others who are receiving you and your ministry report. How they report. Did you notice that? You missed that. Look at verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1. For they themselves report about us and what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God. I'm going to cover point 10 next week. but The report. How do people report your ministry affecting them? And how was their ministry with your model? How, are the, how was the ministry, how was that if they're running by the model and running by the responsibilities of the execution of the model, they should, it should be impacting the same way. Yep. But, but look, they got to have the maturity to be able to hold it. It's your responsibility. If you've got leadership in it, it's your responsibility to train them. You can do it through the internet, but they need to be trained. You know, they, they've got to get into they got to get into to meet because babies can't do that. This requires you. This reports the reports that come back about how your ministry is affecting people. This requires you to be objective to constructive criticism and how your ministry is affecting others. And is it reaching God's intended spiritual purpose regarding your model? Okay? So you really want to pay attention to that stuff. And if you think God is maybe moving your ministry into a model of some sort, feel free to come and talk to me about it. I could talk to you at Mid's Prayer Breakfast. Or I could talk to you Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at Cracker Barrel in Trustful. Huh? Let's have prayer. Remember, 
those of you that would be interested in this type of stuff, John would like to meet just shortly with you and talk about how to use the Internet to impact. And uh, we've certainly set the stage for that. He said he wouldn't take long. So, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I know a lot of people, they, they want to buy a, a model kit or something. No, the Holy Spirit does all this. It's not one model fits all. It just depends on what, what, how God is leading and directing. But there are substance to it. There are keys. What is, God, what is God's will in regard to this? How, how is that going to work? What do you envision? Is it compatible with the word of God? We, we pray for these things today, Father. Thessalonian church did it. And they did it because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the great need around them. And it just shows us who's the head of the church. The head of the church is also the Savior of the body. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful to be a part of that. Encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.